Welcome to the best genealogy tips and tricks. These are a lot of strategies that we use every day in genealogy. And so I think you're going to get a lot out of this. This is kind of an overview of some of these strategies. So if you have not uh, met me before, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist, as I like to say. Really, I've been doing genealogy, kind of really got into it when I was a teenager. So I say about 47 years in genealogy, but I really kind of got bitten by the bug when I was about six, sitting with my great grandmother when she was showing me old photographs of the Danish ancestors. So I was also spent 40 years in television broadcasting, I started out as a production assistant in a public broadcasting station in Southern California ended up as a uh, general manager of a CBS station. So I kind of say I went from PBS to CBS. So, you know, collectively between genealogy and my experience in television broadcasting, it was kind of a marriage made in heaven to have the YouTube channel. I love teaching genealogy and it is really a passion of mine. So that's why I created the uh, genealogy TV YouTube and Academy. So. Uh, there's more to the story though. We'll get into that here in a minute. All right, so let's talk about some of the best genealogy tips and tricks. You know, there's a lot to this. We're going to talk about, just kind of touch on some of these different areas as we get going. Uh, now, the five areas that we're really going to kind of talk about are some brick wall strategies. We're going to talk about ancestry, family search, some bonus tips, and kind of what I call getting into the zone. Okay, so we're going right for it. Right now, the very first thing that I think you need to know, if you are not keeping research notes, this is the number one way that you're going to solve your genealogical problems. Why is that? Because when you sit down and write research notes, and there, this is a skill that you can learn. There's actually a way to do this that will really help you and we'll get into that a little bit, but when you are writing research notes, you're writing the details and it's making you pay attention to the details. And that is where the success happens. So let's talk about ancestry for a minute. You can keep research notes on ancestry. However, it's really limited. You could have research notes that look like this, as opposed to this little section over here where you can't really put images in. You can't really put all of the details in, you can't format it, you can't bold it, you can't make things red. You know, I like to, I like to highlight stuff and you can't really do that in the notes section at Ancestry. And this is one of the reasons why I strongly advise you to keep research notes on your direct line ancestors. Your research notes could look like this. And we're going to jump into a little bit more detail about research notes. So here is the first page of a research project I was working on recently. And one of the first things you might want to pay attention to is if you find the same person on family search, grab the ID number because every ancestor on family search has a unique ID number, grab that ID number and put it in your research notes. And so here is a book that I had transcribed a couple paragraphs out of the book and put it into my research notes. And if you'll notice here, I put a reference note. So this is actually a Word document and in Word, there's actually a reference note. You don't actually type the number two and put it in superscript. You actually use the reference notes and when you do, all those reference notes will follow the paragraphs. No matter how many times you insert stuff, it's going to, those reference notes are going to follow. So one of the things that you want to do when you're creating research notes is write them in chronological order and start with a date. I always put the date first, then in bold. Now we write genealogy dates typically with the date, then the month, and then the year. Now, a lot of us use a three letter. So June might be J-U-N instead of J-U-N-E. Just saying. You could also take information that you have abstracted out of, say, a census record and put into an Excel file. If you want to take bits and pieces of that out of your Excel file, you could embed them into your research notes. It's a little bit of a trick to do. It's a kind of a two-step process to get it in here. But when you do, it's 
you know, you've got all that information at your fingertips. I typically don't do this. I typically will actually use my microphone and the dictation tool and actually dictate into Word what I'm seeing as I'm reading across. But you could do this. The reason why I like reading it is because it makes me pay attention to the details. Again, if I'm cutting and pasting, I might not be paying attention to the details, okay? So a few rules about research notes. Keep them in chronological order, starting with a date, then what it is, the item, it's a birth certificate or whatever it is, and then the details about it. Uh, you want abstracts only. So if you are taking, say, a will, for example, and you transcribe the entire will, as you should, and then what you do is you take out all the boilerplate language, which leaves the abstract. The abstract is what goes into your research notes. Why do we do this this way? It's because when we are trying to do research and we're trying to quickly jump to a section of our research notes, because honestly, they can get really long after a while. You don't want to have to read through all of these notes to figure out what it is that you or trying to answer quickly. So by doing everything in chronological order and abstracts only, you can quickly jump to the area or timeline in your ancestors research notes. You can jump to that part of the timeline quickly to help you figure out where he was last at that year or that time when you're doing some research. Cite your sources. I can't say this enough. 10 years later, when you come back to this ancestor and you're looking at it again, you're going to wonder where you got that information. And so you want to know where you got it. And so you're going to cite your sources. Images are okay. I don't put a lot of images in there. Sometimes I do it just because I think it's cool. You know, a ship or something that I think is really neat. I will put in there. I don't put a lot of images in there. I think it can get too crowded with images, but a, a portrait or a ship something that helps me understand or identify items. I will certainly put those in my research notes. Use references. So you want to use reference notes, not end notes. So if you use reference notes, those are the references that are at the bottom of the page. And as you insert stuff, they will move off into the next page as as your paragraph that it's referencing goes with it. And the reason why you do this with reference notes instead of end notes, now let me explain, end notes are at the end of the document. All of the references would go to the end of the document kind of like you would see in a book. That's fine if you're writing a book, but if you're writing research notes, you want the reference notes on the same page with the paragraph in which you are talking about because that way, if somebody copies just that page, they get the reference material that goes with it, okay? And lastly, the 200-year rule. So if you've not heard me talk about my 200-year rule, this is it. Can someone navigate your records, navigate your research notes? Can someone navigate your files 200 years from now without a finding aid? So if you have some elaborate numbering system you probably have a key or something at the front end of that or a legend on how to navigate those notes. Well, what if they've only, you know, copied page 98 of your 300 pages of notes? It could be that they can't figure it out without the finding aid, which was probably on the first page. So my goal is to consider, getting you to consider, not using really elaborate numbering systems, but a simple uh, system that anyone can navigate, okay? All right, so now let's talk about getting organized and staying organized. This is really key. If you really want success in your genealogy, you need to stay organized. You need to stay organized with your files. You need to, whether it's on your computer or in your filing cabinet, you need to stay organized with your online life. You need to keep your research questions top of mind and you keep your research notes up to date. And so one of the things that I suggest is that you don't get overwhelmed by the organization thing. Pick one ancestor, one research question, and organize that one person. And I would suggest that you start with like your grandparents or your parents and work backwards as you go. 
because if you feel like you ha can't do any research until you get the whole filing cabinet organized, then you may not ever get to research. It may take you too long. So pick the people that are important to you and uh, get organized and stay organized. All right, let's talk about the family, friends, associates, and neighbors. So the fan club is the friends, associates, and neighbors. Thank you, Elizabeth Schoen Mills for that acronym. And this is together, the fan club plus the family together. It are, these are all the people that, you know, really kind of touched your ancestors life, right? These are the family, the friends, the associates, the neighbors, the witnesses, the informants on different documents, your church family, all of these people touched your ancestors life. They worked together. They played together. They lived together, right? They're all in the same neighborhood. They may have done business together. They may have fought in the military together and they probably worshiped together. So my point being is we don't stop with just our ancestor in the immediate family. We really kind of need to look at all of the witnesses and all the informants and all of the neighbors. <laughs> that touched our ancestors life. Okay. So here's another example. So let's pretend you're looking at the census record and this is your ancestor. Now I know you can't read that and it really doesn't matter that you read it because it's not important. My point is that you want to research the neighbors on either side of your ancestor and you want to research all of the ancestors, at least five pages, excuse me, all of the neighbors, at least five pages, on either side of your ancestor because it's you're likely going to find other family members living nearby. I typically will do at minimum 10 pages on either side and sometimes the entire roll. Now this roll is 50 pages long. So I might not do all 50 pages, but I bet I do 20 of them, you know? So once you do that, and if you extract that information, say into an Excel spreadsheet, and I've got videos on how to do that, then you have that information to use over and over again. So as you find more surnames in your family, you can go back to that Excel spreadsheet and search for those surnames to see if they are actually in the neighborhood. All right, let's continue this conversation about the fan club and the family on find a grave. So at find a grave, we can, there's a lot of fan club research we can do on find a grave. So let's take a look at this. First of all, if you happen to go to a cemetery or graveyard and you are the one taking pictures and you're going to upload them to find a grave, please, please, please take both a close up and a wide shot. Now you want a wide shot because a lot of times, like I said, the family are close by. Well, even in a cemetery, we have neighbors and those neighbors are likely family members buried together. And so when we take a wide shot, we can actually see, you know, when we zoom in on the photograph, we can see the names of other people buried nearby. Another tip is to uh, leave flowers and you're not actually leaving real flowers. You're not purchasing anything. You're actually leaving virtual flowers. And there is a reason we do this. So when you leave virtual flowers, it puts a timestamp on there as to when you were there. So find a grave is free. Just sign up. It's owned by Ancestry. It, they're not going to bug you. They might send you, uh, you know, I don't actually remember ever sending, getting anything from find a grave, but they might send you a, a hint once in a while on Ancestry. So here I, I was here in 2017 and had uploaded some images and I can see that there are other people here. Well, those people might be family members. So we might want to drill into that person and learn some more from them. So there's some other things you can do while you're here. You can drill into the cemetery. A lot of people don't know this, but if you click on the cemetery, so this is Greenwood Cemetery where George Knox is buried and you'll get this pop-up little window where you can search for other people. Well, if you just plug in Knox or other surnames that are in the family, you are likely going to find other family members that are also buried in that same cemetery. So 
Uh, that can be pretty helpful when you're searching on find a grave. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you, oh, let me back up, is you can drill into the photographer. So if you click on the photographer, in this case it's me, you get the photographer's profile. And the profile can tell you a lot of things. First of all, it might give you some information like, you may use my photographs, thanks. So theoretically, we're supposed to be getting permission if we download those photographs and upload them to Ancestry. So a lot of times a photographer will automatically put in there, yes, you can use my photographs, knock yourself out. And then you might see some other people in there that a photographer is following. Now over here on the right hand side, this is really where there's some interesting information. If we look a little bit closer, you can see how many memorials that this photographer added. In this case, it was me. I've added 10 memorials and added 43 photographs. And so here, if you see somebody who's added thousands of memorials, they probably are not a relative. They probably don't know any more information than what you know, is already on the memorial because they're probably just a hobbyist or they work for the cemetery and they went out and photographed all the, you know, so there may not be any more information, but it doesn't hurt to, you know, email them and find out because you can drill in and email the photographer at find a grave. So the other thing you want to do is create a virtual cemetery. So a virtual cemetery is basically where you can take all of your different ancestors and put them in one in into one cemetery even if they're buried at several different cemeteries so what you would do if you're on the on the memorial page you click that save to and this window pops up you could save it to ancestry you could save it to a clipboard or whatever click on virtual cemetery and when you do you're going to get the opportunity you can create a virtual cemetery by clicking the plus button here i have created several of them and I can check box one or many of the virtual cemeteries that I've created and I hit save. And then when I want to go back and I can have all of the Knox, you know, ancestors in one virtual cemetery, even if they're buried in seven different states, it doesn't really matter. So it can be very helpful. All right, let's switch gears for a minute and talk about floating trees. This is, I think, one of the coolest strategies. I love this strategy, and the reason why is because basically what it does, if you have people in records that you're not sure about, or you have found ancestors that you don't know how they relate, like maybe you have some DNA cousins and you've looked in their tree and you can see the surnames are the same as yours, but you have no idea who these people are, you can create floating trees using these people and then research them and then hopefully eventually you'll figure out the connection this is really best done on ancestry you can't really do this on any platform that has a collaborative tree for example family search or wiki tree you can't really do it there you might be able to do it on my heritage i've never really tried it ancestry is my favorite to do this on so let's talk about that so really all a floating tree is is a disconnected person or branch of people that is separated from your main tree okay so let's take a look at this for a second let's pretend for a moment that i'm in my tree and i see this potential father and potential mother popping up and i want to i want to take a look at them and i have you know done my reasonably exhaustive research on elizabeth clearly i have not because there's a hint here so i must go look at that but once I'm done with Elizabeth, I could then go and take a look at this potential father. So I click on the potential father and a side window pops up. And it says that it's got some information and there's 12 records. Of course, we're going to click into those records and we're going to examine them closely. This is an overview, so we're not going to do that today. But you're going to examine those records and come to a determination of whether this William Bennett here belongs to, is the father of Elizabeth or not. Well, let's pretend for a moment that you're not sure. Well, if you were sure, you could hit yes, and then 
William would be added here as the father. But let's pretend for a moment you want to create a floating tree because you want to investigate this guy a little more. Maybe you want to jump onto a different platform and see if you can find some more records that Ancestry is not popping up. You're going to do your research like I'm going to show you here shortly about how to go about seeing if you can get all the juicy goodness out of Ancestry you can. And then, you know, you're going to go over to you know, family search and some other platforms and maybe find some more records. But right now you're not sure. Well, we can add him as a floater in the tree by clicking yes temporarily. So what that will do is he'll make, make William go in here and then we're going to immediately disconnect him from Elizabeth. So we hit yes. And now William Bennett is in here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go into William Bennett's profile. And in William Bennett's profile, you go edit, edit relationships, and you get to a screen like this. Now we're going to, I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit, but you get to this screen right here and then you remove Elizabeth as the daughter by hitting the X. And then he is no longer, there's no relationship to anybody. And then William is now floating on his own. Okay, so now what happens is William and anybody else connected to William would be then separated. Now you're not going to find William in the tree unless you go up to that search button in the upper right corner of your tree and search for his name or you use tree tags. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so there are a lot of episodes that I have done on the YouTube channel for floating trees. In fact, I'm going to throw out a handout here soon that has a lot of links for the some of these different episodes that I've done that really kind of gets a little bit deeper into these different subjects that I'm talking about. So if you just went over to say to the YouTube channel, go to youtube.com forward slash genealogy TV and then search my videos and just search the word floating or float, you're going to get all of the episodes popping up that I have done on floating trees. All right, so let's talk about Ancestry for a minute. We've got several things that we're going to talk about here and how to search on Ancestry and how to, you know, fix some mistakes and do some ID stuff. So let's, let's start with this first connections bucket that I've got here. So here I am on a profile on Ancestry and what we're going to do is we're going to go up to edit and edit relationships. This is where you would disconnect a floater, you know, from the tree so that you could do it. So that's where you could fix any mistakes. If you got someone that is not in the right configuration, like they need to be labeled as a step person or a uh, some other relationship you could that's where you do it is in edit relationships okay and so uh, what we're going to do also is pay attention to some of the details in our ancestors profile so for example if we were to click on this this link right here believe it or not that is a link and then we also have tree tags so let's talk about this so if we click on this link right here, it gives us the path from me all the way to this woman, my, the wife of a second grade uncle. Uh, so uh, that is a fun little tool that a lot of people don't even really realize is there. Let's talk about tree tags for a minute. So if we uh, jump into the tree tags, here's what you can do. So with the tree tags, this pops out this side window. You can create custom tree tags, but Ancestry's already created a lot of tags for you already that you can use that just by hitting these little drop downs and you can see some of the stuff that they've added. Now, if you wanted to, one of the ones I use a lot is this hypothesis and unverified, because if I'm not sure about a person, I'm going to mark it that way. And I also will put see comments and explain myself. So here in the custom tree tags, if you want to create a custom tree tag, you just hit the custom tree tag and add one. Here I've already created a floating tree and C comments. I use those two a lot. And so when I add those, I can then have those in there. So let's talk about notes. Notes are private and comments are public. So think of it as kind of like comments are 
like you're publicly commenting on a, on a forum or something. So that kind of helped me uh, remember. And now they have, they have added some of these fonts in here that tells you, you know, this is a public comment. So, but this is where you'll also find those tree tags. All right, let's talk about finding those floaters now. If you go back to your main tree and you go to the filters tab, you can find those tree tags again. If you mark those people that were floating with a tree tag, when you hit that filter down to the tree tags, now you've got a list of everybody that is floating in your tree. So that can be really helpful. I have some of the viewers from the YouTube channel that pointed that out, that that's how they were using those custom tree tags. And boy, that was like a game changer. That was very helpful. So uh, your comments always do help on the, uh, in the YouTube channel because everybody learns from everybody, right? All right, so moving on, let's talk about how to search. So we're going to talk about how to search from hints, how to search from profile, and how to search from the card catalog. So here in the family tree, you know, you've got these hints, right? You've got two different kinds of hints, really, that are popping up in the family tree. They've got the potential father or mother, and you've got the leafy hint. So I advise that you start here because this is the low-hanging fruit. This is what you're going to find. Now, you can also search from the ancestors profile by hitting the search button. And when you do, what's going to happen is you're going to get this pre-populated uh, view of your ancestors profile, but really it's a search, right? It's coming up with results, but it's pre-populated with all of the stuff that's in his profile. And so sometimes less is more. Sometimes this is too much information. Now, in this case, we're getting a lot of records uh, popping up. So that's not a, an issue here, but we might want to run the sliders to try and narrow our results a little bit. So you're going to play with this side panel over here. You can also use this pencil icon and click into the edit and actually see it says hide three fields. There's actually, when you get into this and you click on this, you can actually X out some of this information so that you don't have too much information because sometimes you won't find any records. Then the other thing I want to point out was this little active button over here. And a lot of people don't realize this. This is smart filtering. So smart filtering is when it's turned on and it's active and Ancestry is recommending you do that. I'm recommending you do it first. And then if you're not finding what you need, turn it off. And the reason why is because if it's turned on and let's say you have found already the 1880 census for your ancestor that you're researching and your ancestor happened to be in the 1880 census twice as mine was, then you won't find that second instance of your ancestor in that record set because it's turned on and it's, it's eliminating any more searches for that record set. So in this case, with it on the 1880 census, it would not deliver anything from the 1880 census because it's turned on. So if you're not finding what you're looking for, turn it off and try again. Just pointing that out. All right, the third way. Let's talk about the card catalog. So the card catalog, you go to the search tab, drop down to card catalog. And when you get to the card catalog, you have an unfiltered list. Okay. It is everything that Ancestry has to offer. And it is kind of nice because now you can think what exactly is it that I want. And you can, with your ancestor in mind, you can use these filters on the side to narrow the results. You can also sort by record count so that you get the most records delivered to the top that have better odds of finding ancestors in there. So what you would do is you would right click. Once you get things set up the way you want, you drill in, you would right click and open in a new tab each of the record sets that look promising. So what you want to do is you want to use those filters on the, on the left hand side, and you're going to drill in by first by location. So you're going to drill in like for me, I might be drilling into, let's say USA and Nevada. And you, I recommend you when you're drilling in by location, you drill to the state level. 
You can go all the way to the county level in a lot of cases, but sometimes you might get one book that's about the county or something. So if you stay at the state level or the parish level, I mean at the you know district level or whatever country you're in, if you stay at a little bit broader territory, then you're going to get, like in the U.S., you're going to get the census records in that list as well. Whereas if you drilled all the way to the county level, the census records go away. And so you want to keep that in mind when drilling in by location. Then you want to drill in by time frame. And again, if you're not finding what you want, let's say you're going into the, I don't know, 1870s, and you're not finding what you want, back up and go to the 1800s at the top of the list so that you get the entire century instead of the decade. So those are a couple tips there. So um, open each one in a, in a separate tab and then search by name. Now you're going to have to do this manually, type in their name. When you type in their name, you're going to get a pop-up with people that are in your tree. I suggest that you don't use that because if you do, it's going to pre-populate as if you had searched from their profile and that doesn't do you any good because you've already done that. And so what you want to do is try and get a, a little bit less filtered list to try and find some of those records that you didn't catch in the first two phases, the hints and the profile search. All right, so first by hints, then by profiles, and then card catalog, and then if you have to, turn off the smart filters, okay? Now, let's talk about doing something similar at Family Search. And so you first want to search by the tree, and then by records, and then you want to search the wiki. And we'll talk about each one of those right now. So here is the Family Search tree. And if you're not familiar with Family Search, it's a world collaborative tree. It's one giant tree. It is not your tree. But if you have identified yourself in the tree, then when you log in, it's going to focus in on the World Collaborative tree where you are. And so that way, you'll know, you know you're working on your ancestors. Now, you could search anyone in the World Collaborative tree. It really doesn't matter. But it's always going to bring you back here to begin with. So let's drill into one of my ancestors. And uh, this is Christiane Beck. And it's going to pop up with this mini profile. And this mini profile is going to give you uh, the collaborators, the sources, and those are the things that I'm focused on first. Oh, there's other people working on this. Okay, there's other people that are working on Christiane Beck. That probably means that they are a cousin and or related somehow. And so I'm going to pay attention to who also is collaborating. And I'm also going to pay attention to those sources. It might be that because my main tree is on Ancestry, that's my go-to tree. I build it there because I know it's my work. But I'm using Family Search all the time. And it might be that I have 10 sources on my tree at Ancestry. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. There's 13 over here. There's some differences for sure. So let's investigate. So you're going to go and investigate those sources. And when you do, you're going to get a list. Now, there's 13 sources. I couldn't show you all of them here because it would be too long of a page and you wouldn't be able to read it. So let's pretend for a moment that we want to drill into this first one. We click on that down arrow and we get a record that looks something like this. We can then drill into some more information. It's got a lot of things we can, we can play with. We can look at the collaborators on this one. There's several things that we can do here. One of the things we want to note is the number, the ID number at Family Search. Add that to our research notes at the very top so that, and you might even want to hyperlink it. You could grab the URL and add a web link on your Ancestry account if you want to. You also want to follow. And following allows you, depending on how you put your, set your notifications on Family Search, you can get notifications when somebody changes stuff over here. And that could be helpful. Uh, so let's talk about searching uh, from records. So click on the search button, drop down to records, and then you get a pop-up that kind of looks like this. Well, when you do that, you're searching everything in general. I like to go straight into more options. That is my thing. And when you do, you get a different, a little bit more elaborate screen. And from there, you can actually click into each one of these different tabs and add information if you want to help narrow the results of your search. 
So a lot of times if I have a couple events that I want to add to it, I will. You can also add a spouse or parents or whatever down here. Here's a tip. Let's pretend you're on Ancestry for a moment and you can't really read this document. Or this, let's say it's a 1910 census record. You can find that same record on Family Search because sometimes one or the other reader is easier to read. And so if you happen to look at the source citation and you notice an FHL number, that means Family History Library, and you can add that number on the Family Search search. So let's go back over to the Family Search page and you can insert that, just copy and paste it into this section right here. Make sure you're on this tab and you can see the film number and add that film number. Now what that's gonna do is it's gonna get you to the role but it's not going to get you to the person. So what you need to do is pay attention to the page number on Ancestry. It says that this, uh, my ancestor was on page 9B. So then we go over to Family Search and it will populate that in when we start to do the search and we need to add this information about my ancestor. Just a couple things. Doesn't mean it has to be a lot. And sure enough, William Smith pops up to the top of the page. So now what we can do is we can click on the little camera icon and look at the image. And a lot of times the images are cleaner on Family Search than they are on Ancestry. So if you're seeing really faint looking images on, it could be either or. It could be that it's Family Search that the image is faint. You want to go find on an Ancestry or vice versa. But a lot of times I'm finding that the images are cleaner and the contrast is a little bit better on family search so you click into the the pencil um, in, into the camera icon and then remember it was page 9b you can go find that same scroll forward to page 9b and find this ancestor all right let's talk about the research wiki so at family search they have this research wiki so here's the tip about research wiki if you want to find out about anything where am I going to find a record for so-and-so? What are, where are the marriage records for, you know, Randolph County, North Carolina? Where are the wills listed for, you know, Albany County, Wyoming? I don't know. You go to the wiki. Go, so you go to the search, you drop down to wiki, and it comes to a page like this. You drill into the location. Just keep drilling. So you click on North America, then you pick the United States, then you pick Wyoming, then you pick Albany County, right? And it's going to tell you where those records are. Now, in this case, I drilled into Ontario, Canada. And you can see here that, that you can jump straight to some online records if you want. But what I do is I pay attention to this right-hand side. These are kind of like hyperlinks. They jump you down the page to where you can find it. So if I was trying to find say vital records, I could click on that and jump on down to that part of the page. So that could be really helpful. All right, some bonus tips. Always look for the original source. I can't emphasize this one enough. So in this case, this is a social security applications and claims index. You can see there's no information here. So what we want to do is we want to look at the source information and we're looking for the words original data or original source and it gives us what looks like a very similar name but it's actually the images not the it's the information it's the data not necessarily the index so it'll have more information so we want to seek that out so that's bonus tip number one bonus tip number two is to add those close dna cousins as floaters in your tree if they are of interest. You don't need to do this on everyone. I have thousands of people in my tree. It would take me forever. But we could add those DNA cousins that I'm looking at their trees and going, okay, wait a minute. I either want to add the DNA cousins if I'm doing a DNA process, some sort of research, or I want to add their ancestors because they have the same last names, the same surnames that I have in my family. We have a DNA connection. Clearly, they are related somehow, but we haven't figured that out. Use uh, them as floaters. Make sure you're marking them with the tree tags as floaters so that you can find them again. And so uh, that's a huge tip.
All right, bonus tip number three. The power of using family search and ancestry together is huge. This is my number one thing I do all the time. I build my tree on ancestry. I do the reasonably exhaustive research on ancestry and I do it again on family search. Why do I do that? While a lot of the records may overlap, there are a lot of differences in records as well. Plus, the algorithms work differently. People index this stuff. They weren't the same indexers that were indexing, say, the census records and stuff. So they may have typed things differently when they were reading those census records. They may have mis, you know, one may have misinterpreted the spelling of a name and the other one got it right or close enough that the search engines are finding it for you. So you want to be searching in both places all the time. It is just standard MO for me, okay? Bonus tip number four is that you might actually want to expand that even further and go to MyHeritage or Find My Past or Wikitree or some of the other places, GeniaNet, some of the other places that you might find other resources. It just depends on what your research question is right now. So if you are working hard at trying to find some of your ancestors that lived in maybe London, England, then you might want to go over to Find My Past because they focus on the UK and Ireland records. My Heritage has records from all over the world you know, they picked up the French company, the genealogy company over there. So they may have French records that nobody else has. Again, their indexing and their uh, search engines may be working differently as well. Bonus tip number five is to get organized. Even if it's just on the ancestor that you are working on right now that you're most curious about, you want to have fun and success. So you want to organize that one ancestor or maybe it's the husband, wife, and kids. You want to organize that ancestor so that you can have fun doing the research. Then you wanna stay organized as you start to discover things. And then you want to add this information to your research notes as you find it. And then when you do, you can get into the zone, what I call the genealogy research zone. And when you're in the zone, then you can really focus on the ancestor you're working on, the fan club, the family, and all that information is at your fingertips. You can get to it quickly and easily, and it makes research a lot of fun. So there are a ton of episodes on the YouTube channel that are kind of dig in deeper about a lot of these concepts that I have been talking about. And so all you have to do is go over there and search the videos on Genealogy TV for whatever subject it is that you are looking for. I've got 300 and, I don't know, 25 episodes up there now. It wouldn't be hard to probably find something that you are looking for. And, you know, you can always ask in the comments. I'm, I'm constantly reading the comments. All right. So here's a funny story why I kind of started this whole thing in the first place. Now, I told you that I had gotten bitten by the bug as a kid, but as an adult, I have been a photographer, a wildlife photographer for a long time. I belong to a local camera club. And every time I go to the local camera club, it seems like we start talking more about genealogy than we do about photography. And so that's when I decided to create the Genealogy TV YouTube channel because I kept going, I'm answering the same comments over and over again. I might as well just create some videos. So that's kind of how the YouTube channel was born was because I was just trying to help people understand how to do their genealogy. So then I got to thinking, well, nobody's really teaching genealogy skills kind of the way I thought they should be taught. And so then I decided, well, if that's the case, then let's open up the Genealogy TV Academy. And then we can kind of take a deeper dive because on the YouTube channel, they're usually 10 to 20 minute videos. Here we can kind of take a deeper dive and, and get into the subject a little bit more skill-based type of education. So let me tell you a little bit about the Academy. These are all skills that you can learn. They're skills about how to get organized, how to research records, how to do evidence and now evaluation. So what that is, is like you find a record 
there's a, there's a lot that you can read into a record that is not always on the printed page. And so you, just by examining the record and looking at it, you can kind of tell uh, a little bit more about it. So evidence evaluation is really one record, okay? And then correlation of evidence is when you're taking all of those evaluations and you're comparing them against each other for facts, like do the birth dates match up? Do the name spellings match up? And then you're basically correlating all your evidence. That too is a skill and you're documenting it. We talk about research tools, some of which we talked about today and research strategies. This is what I do at the Academy. I now it, here's the thing. I don't really get into how to find your Italian ancestry. That's not what the Academy is about at least not right now. Right now, it is all about research skills because it's a, a subject that anyone can use. And so once you learn these skills, you can take your family tree back ancestor after ancestor, generation after generation, as far as the paper trail will let you, okay? So at the Genealogy TV Academy, you get those all taught online from, you can, you can learn from the comfort of your home. So there are two components to the academy. There is the self-guided courses and the live classroom. So the self-guided courses are self-paced. You can do them anytime you want, day or night. Doesn't matter, they're pre-built, they're already there for you. The live classroom is once a month, we get together uh, and do a presentation about a different lesson. And so this is all based on a monthly membership. So how the Academy works is you've got the self-guided courses that one of them is called Getting Started in Genealogy. This is really aimed at beginners and then Smart Research, which is really aimed at everybody else. It is all of the skills that we are talking about, uh, how to write research notes, how to do good research, all that kind of stuff. There are tons of lessons and videos, handouts and worksheets. There is so much in there. So the live presentation is done once a month. That is via Zoom, just like we are right now. And so if you can, you know, if you're a little shy about technology, if you made it to this class, you can make it to the, <laughs> to the Genealogy TV Academy Zoom classes. It's not that hard. They happen the first Wednesday of every month at 3 p.m. And yes, they are recorded so that if you cannot make it at that time, you can watch the replay. But then we also have the Q&A. So we haven't talked about that yet. So once a month, we get together on a different day and we have what I call office hours. And this is just where I show up and answer questions. So a lot of times people will send in questions in advance and I collect those up and then we get together on a Zoom call and we answer them. And the cool part about the Q&A is that everybody learns from everybody else's questions. There are no stupid questions. And so when we get into those Q&A, a lot of times they become little mini demonstrations. Sometimes somebody wants to know how to do something on Ancestry or something. I'll pop over to Ancestry and show them how to do it right there in the live Zoom call. Those happen on the third Wednesday of each month at three o'clock. Now, sometimes these dates change if I'm traveling or something, but for the most part, I try and keep them on the same day. And yes, those are recorded as well. So if you can't make it, you can catch the replay. Both the live classroom and presentation and the Q&A, you know, are monthly. So you basically, we're getting together every couple of weeks. So keep in mind too, that all of this stuff has handouts and worksheets. There are a lot, a lot of handouts, worksheets, templates, things that you can use to help organize. Some of them have to do with census and lining up and correlating that evidence in census records and such. So there is, uh, there's a lot up there. It's just a matter of digging it out. Also, there is the uh, library of stuff that we have already done in the live classroom that all of those videos are available for you as well uh, that are part of the course platform. So everything is uh, included. So we also have a Genealogy TV Insiders Facebook group. So if you don't want to wait for the Q&A, you have a question, jump into the Facebook group and ask. This is a community. Everybody helps each other. I try and get in there every day and answer any questions that may pop up. And it, 
people are sharing stuff that they find. If there's a good link for something, somebody might find it and share it. But the community at large is all here to help each other. We all learn from each other. I learn from you as well. And so all together with the handouts and the Facebook group, the annual value is $6,700 a year. So my question is how much is it worth to you to have the confidence in your family history, to find your ancestors, right? To break down some of those brick walls and to get organized, to find the records and to use those same skills over and over again so that you can share it with your family, right? That's the goal and to share it and preserve it for future generations. Our stories are getting lost as time progresses and we want to preserve that information. So membership is $59 a month. That's a huge savings over the annual value. Right now, because of this webinar, I am offering it at a 25% discount. You can get in at $44.25 a month if you go to genealogytv.org forward slash academy and you purchase the course. You can go there and look at the um, click through on the get started button and use GTVA 25 and the percent symbol as part of the coupon code at checkout and you will get 25% off of your membership. Okay. So if you uh, go to the Academy, click on the red button and you can get started right away. If you want to learn a little bit more, see what some of the other students have been saying, click on the blue button and it'll teach you a little bit more about the Academy. There's a video up there that I put up there, a little introductory video. And so what I want you to know is that if you're committed to learning, I'm committed to teaching. And my goal is to help you go further, faster, and factually, as my tagline always says, uh, with your family history research. It truly is what I am passionate about. What I love to do is to teach genealogy. And then you can do the happy dance when you find your ancestors. And uh, so everybody loves the genealogy happy dance. So here's my guarantee. If you change your mind for any reason and you aren't satisfied, just send me an email within 14 days and I will give you a full refund within 24 business hours. So uh, that's how strongly I feel about this. I think I haven't had anybody take me up on it. So I am um, assuming that I must be doing something right over there. If you join, you'll get three handouts. Uh, you'll get as a bonus, these 10 tips to breaking down brick walls and getting unstuck, how to create great research notes, how to group your DNA matches on Ancestry into the four lines of your grandparents, which I think would be helpful. And so collectively, all together, the value is $67.75 annually, and you can get in at $44.25 a month using that GTVA 25% code. And right now, I'm going to offer it one more thing. You can... If you pick the annual option, you're already going to get a discount in advance of the coupon code. So you can actually stack these two discounts. Then at checkout, make sure you put that GTVA 25% code in there. And if, it basically equates to $33.50 a month, which I think is an incredible uh, savings. So I'm trying to make it as affordable as possible for everyone and to get some quality professional education on how to do genealogy the right way, the skills that you can learn so that you can take your family history back generation after generation. And with that, I thank you for your time today. I hope you learned something new. I would love to hear about it. If you do, feel free to, to leave the notes in the comments and such. And so we will see you in the next webinar or on the YouTube channel or hopefully at the Academy. <laughs>